live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. December 31st, 2006. One of the craziest scenarios in the history of the NFL playoffs materialized in what can only be described as an absolute miracle. For the Kansas City Chiefs to somehow make the playoffs, they needed four things to happen, all of which ranged from unlikely to almost impossible. They needed to defeat the Jacksonville Jaguars. The New England Patriots needed to go on the road and defeat one of the hottest teams in football, the Tennessee Titans. The Pittsburgh Steelers, with nothing to play for, needed to go on the road and defeat a Cincinnati Bengals team that they lost to earlier in the year. And most unlikely by far, the San Francisco 49ers, one of the worst teams in football, a team that had lost four of its last five games, had to go on the road and defeat the Denver Broncos. The situation was so dire that rookies passed around footballs earlier in the week to be signed, which is what you typically do when the season is over, and was so dire that guard Brian Waters said on the scenarios, it's not even an issue, man. You look at those matchups. You really try not to lean too much on that because you don't want to be disappointed. And yet, somehow, all four of those things happen. Somehow, the Chiefs found themselves in the playoffs against all odds. It was incredibly unlikely, but it actually happened. That's what was going down in the AFC. In the NFC, however, that's a completely different story. Because in 2006, NBC was banking on this game right here, the battle between the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers, to mean something when they decided to flex it into the Sunday Night Football time slot. They took a giant gamble that it would mean something. And in actuality, it meant nothing. Thanks in part to one of the wackiest playoff scenarios in NFL history that, to the surprise of no one, did not wind up materializing. Because this is the story behind NBC's gamble and what might just be, in the over 100 year history of the NFL, the wackiest playoff scenario of all time. Before I talk about the scenario in question, we need some context to understand who this team was, what the original game plan was, and why NBC even decided to put this game on Sunday Night Football in the first place. The year is 2022, and after a bad loss in Week 13, where they allowed their highest point total of the season, and where a lot of people are speculating whether or not their starting quarterback would retire afterwards, the Packers stood at 4-8, and, and looked dead in the water. However, after winning three straight games, they find themselves firmly in the playoff picture with a 7-8 record. With, oh, oh wait, my bad, that's the wrong year. My apologies, let's try that again. The year is 2006, and after a bad loss in week 13 where they allowed their highest point total of the season, where a lot of people were speculating whether or not their starting quarterback would retire afterwards, the Packers sit at 4-8 and eight and look dead in the water. However, after winning three straight games, they find themselves firmly in the playoff picture with a 7-8 and eight record. Granted, the teams that they beat on this hot streak of theirs were not exactly impressive, as they were three teams who ended the season with losing records and not a whole lot to play for, beating the 5-7 and seven San Francisco 49ers, the 2-11 and 11 Detroit Lions, and the 6-8 and eight Minnesota Vikings. But they found themselves right in the thick of things after taking care of business. The NFC was kind of a dumpster fire at the very bottom of the playoff picture in 2006, as entering the final week of the season, there were five teams sitting at 7-8 and eight fighting for the number 6 seed, with the Packers being one of them, alongside the New York Giants, the Carolina Panthers, the Atlanta Falcons, and the St. Louis Rams. Somehow, despite looking completely out of it at the start of the month, the Packers had a legitimate chance to play postseason football in Mike McCarthy's first season as a head coach. As for what had to happen for the Packers to make the playoffs, it was pretty simple and pretty doable. First things first, as to be expected, the Packers had to beat the Bears in their final game of the season. Seems pretty self-explanatory. They're not getting in with a 7-9 record. Beat Chicago, who even though you lost 26-0 to them in Week 1, they're playing for nothing, 
as they've clinched home field advantage throughout the postseason, and you keep your hopes alive. Number two, you just need one of three things to happen. The Rams to lose to the Vikings, the Panthers to beat the Saints, or the Falcons to beat the Eagles. In other words, you had three chances to get this one right, based on how the tiebreakers worked out. And number three, and the most important part in all of this, the New York Giants had to lose, as they would be playing Washington on Saturday, December 30th, in front of a national television audience on NFL Network. Although it was more like a semi-national television audience, because half the country didn't have NFL Network at that point. NBC was so confident that this was going to be a winning in lose-and-go-home game for the Packers, that they decided to flex it into Sunday Night Football. This was the first year that Sunday Night Football on NBC was a thing, and because of that, NBC had the option, just as they do every year now, to flex a game into the Sunday Night Time slot in Week 17 based on implications, so that there wasn't a meaningless game to close out the season, as had been the case many times before. Remember when the 1999 season ended with a primetime battle between the 4-11 Atlanta Falcons and the 4-11 San Francisco 49ers? Now, because this was the first year of flex scheduling, and because the flex happened so close to the date of the game, which was New Year's Eve, understandably, this caused some controversy. But that's beside the point. NBC was riding with this game, pretty confident that this would mean something to Green Bay. It didn't matter that there were other games that they could have chosen, like Jets Raiders, which on paper looked like a winning in game for the Jets, or Broncos 49ers, which looked like a winning in game for the Broncos. And even if it turned out to be meaningless, the West Coast would still watch and care as it wouldn't interfere too much with their New Year's Eve plans. They were putting all their chips in the center of the table on the Packers playing for the playoffs. But NBC had nothing to worry about whatsoever. There was no way that New York was going to beat Washington, right? This was a Giants team that was absolutely reeling. They had lost six of their last seven games, and were led by a quarterback in that stretch in Eli Manning, who was legitimately one of the worst quarterbacks in football, having thrown eight touchdowns and nine interceptions. The Giants were playing some atrocious football, and were looking like one of the worst teams in the league as of late. So NBC's got nothing to worry about, and the Packers are going to be playing for a playoff spot against their biggest rival in a winning in game on Sunday Night Football on New Year's Eve. 201 to go, fourth and 10. Campbell. Antoine Randall, oh, not there, but Jabril Wilson dove and knocked it away, and the Giants hang on to win it 34 28. Well, that sucks. Yeah, the New York Giants, somehow, thanks to a 234-yard, three-touchdown performance by Tiki Barber in what would turn out to be his final regular season game ever, saved his best for last, as New York beat Washington by a final score of 34-28, scoring 24 straight points at one point in the game to give them some sort of cushion before Washington came back but couldn't finish the deal. The bad news was that now... NBC's plans seem ruined. Green Bay needed the Giants to lose on Saturday night, and they didn't. The biggest piece in the puzzle was gone. But as dire as things seemed, all hope wasn't lost for Green Bay and for NBC. Because as it turns out, there was another way for Green Bay to get in. And it didn't involve ties or anything crazy like that. It just involved enough teams winning and having it get down to a tiebreaker. And ladies and gentlemen, that takes us to the moment of truth. Introducing, quite possibly, the wackiest playoff scenario of all time. Alright, so there was no way around it still. The Packers had to beat the Bears. In case that wasn't obvious before, it was incredibly obvious now, seeing as the Giants held on to the number 6 seed with an 8-8 eight eight record, and the Packers were 7-8. But beating the Bears to match New York's record wasn't good enough anymore. Because for this, we have to go to the tiebreakers. The first tiebreaker to break a tie between the 8-8 Giants and the would-be 8-8 Packers is head-to-head. -head. In other words, whichever team won the battle between the two teams would have the edge. 
That doesn't apply here, as the two teams did not meet in 2006. That takes us to the second tiebreaker, which is conference record. In this case, it wouldn't apply, as both the Giants and the Packers went 7-5 against NFC teams. Alright, so let's move to the third tiebreaker, which is record against common opponents. Once again, that doesn't break anything, as both teams had four common opponents. The Bears, the Saints, the Eagles, and the Seahawks. Both the Giants and Packers went 1-4 in their five games against those teams, with New York's lone win coming against Philadelphia, and Green Bay's only win coming in Week 17 against Chicago. And this meant that we had to go to the fourth tiebreaker, which was strength of victory. In other words, in the eight games that you won, how good were those wins? Did he beat good teams or bad teams? The better your strength of victory, and the higher quality of your wins, the better your odds are at winning this tiebreaker. And in this case, not only were the Packers way behind the Giants, but they were a solid 10 percentage points off. Because for the Packers to make the playoffs and make up this deficit, it would have to be the most insane Week 17 scenario ever that involved no ties. They not only needed to beat the Bears, but they needed a whopping eight things to happen. Number one, they needed the Detroit Lions to beat the Dallas Cowboys. Number two, they needed the Minnesota Vikings to defeat the St. Louis Rams. Number three, they needed the Seattle Seahawks to defeat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Number four, they needed the Cleveland Browns to beat the Houston Texans. Number five, they needed the Arizona Cardinals to beat the San Diego Chargers. Number six, they needed the San Francisco 49ers to defeat the Denver Broncos. Number seven, they needed the Miami Dolphins to beat the Indianapolis Colts. And number eight, they needed the New Orleans Saints to beat the Carolina Panthers. In other words, the Packers were watching more than half the games in the league on that day. If all those games went Green Bay's way, then the Packers, with a win against the Bears, would be in the playoffs. Now, how likely was this to happen? Not even in the slightest bit. You need the Lions to beat the Cowboys, even though they're 14-point underdogs. You need the Browns to beat the Texans, even though they're 6-point underdogs. You need the Saints, with nothing to play for, to beat the Panthers, even though they're 2-point underdogs. You need the Seahawks, with nothing to play for, to beat the Buccaneers, even though they're 3-point underdogs. You need the Dolphins, a team in shambles with nothing to play for, to beat the Colts, even though they're 9-point underdogs. You need the Cardinals, a 5-10 team with nothing to play for, to beat the Chargers and the best team in the NFL who is fighting for first place, even though they're 14-point underdogs. You need the 49ers, a bad team with nothing to play for, to beat the Broncos, who are fighting for their playoff lives, even though they're 10-point underdogs. Any of the Vikings, a team with nothing to play for, to beat the Rams, even though they're 2.5-point underdogs. Not only did the Packers need 8 results to go their way, but in all 8 games, they needed the underdogs to win. For some perspective on how insane that is, if we assume 50-50 odds, where each team has an equal chance of winning on paper, the odds that this somehow works in Green Bay's favor are 1 in 256. They're already minuscule, and are less than half a percent. However, these aren't 50-50 odds. These are uneven odds, where the team that the Packers need to win is not favored. This is 8 Davids against 8 Goliaths. Because when you put these odds into Vegas, and do this as an 8-game parlay, the odds that this would pay out are plus 2,793,000, 324, meaning that this was so unlikely to happen that if you were to bet $100 on this and all eight games went Green Bay's way, you would win $2,793,324. For some perspective, if you want to bet on a 16 seed to win the NCAA tournament, your odds are usually plus 30,000. These odds are more than 93 times larger than that. For some even more perspective, if I wanted to bet on the Las Vegas Raiders right now to win the Super Bowl, 
their odds are plus 100,000, and they need about a bajillion things to go their way to even have a shot at making the playoffs. The odds that all of these games happen to go Green Bay's way were more than 27 times larger than that. And keep in mind that this doesn't even include Green Bay beating Chicago in a game where they themselves were two and a half point underdogs. If we put that one in there, then the odds are plus 5,810,223, or winning over $5.8 million for a $100 bet. If you just put a dollar on that, just for the fun of it, and it hit, you'd wind up making twice the average American salary. It was unlikely. It was improbable. But at 1 o'clock Eastern on New Year's Eve, a funny thing happened. Because the most unlikely of the games, somehow, went Green Bay's way. Despite Dallas playing for the NFC East crown, and despite Detroit being arguably the worst team in football, entering with a 2-13 record, somehow, the Lions went into the Big D and pulled off the upset. After 9 points in the final 5 minutes of the game, Detroit won by a final score of 39-31. It was a stunning upset that no one saw coming. The 14-point underdogs won straight up. The hardest part of the equation was solved. One down, seven to go. It was early, but could it be? Could this actually be happening? At the same time that the Lions were pulling off their stunning upset, the Seahawks were running train on the Buccaneers. Granted, I'm not sure why exactly the Seahawks were the underdogs, seeing as the Buccaneers were 4-11 and, and the Seahawks were a playoff team playing their starters. But this game was ever close, as Seattle flat out dominated on their way to a 23-7 victory, never trailing at any point throughout the contest, and holding onto the ball for a whopping 38 minutes. So far, so good. Two 1 o'clock games in, and Green Bay was still alive. As Al Michaels says, Do you believe in miracles? Hopefully you don't because that's where the story ends. Because every other game at 1 o'clock did not go Green Bay's way. And none of the 4 o'clock games, with the exception of 49ers Broncos, went their way either. Not that it mattered at that point. Houston beat Cleveland 14-6. Carolina beat New Orleans 31-21. St. Louis beat Minnesota 41-21. Indianapolis beat Miami 27-22. And San Diego beat Arizona 27-20. Three things went Green Bay's way, which was the good news. The bad news was that they needed eight, and five things did not go their way. And this meant that Green Bay's finale on Sunday Night Football, even though they won 26-7 and ended the season on a really high note, was completely and utterly meaningless. NBC was banking on this game to mean something, and it meant nothing, which destroyed the ratings on New Year's Eve, as you can imagine seeing as no one really cared about this game. Yes, you maybe had the Brett Favre retirement angle, but seeing as he teased retirement every single year in the 2000s, that wasn't enough, as the game pulled an abysmal 7.9 rating and a 15 share. For some perspective, the average Sunday night game drew a rating well above 9 that season, so NBC's gamble backfired pretty heavily. Still, even though it obviously didn't work out, we remember all the crazy scenarios that materialized that it's fun to look back at those that didn't, and the weird and wacky things that didn't happen, because it makes when it eventually happens all the more special. The fact that, including the Packers winning their game, nine things had to happen on the final day of the season, with all nine things involving underdogs winning, is nothing short of absurd. Fortunately for the Packers, their path to the playoffs in 2007, when they won the NFC North and got a first round bye, was a heck of a lot easier and simpler. But in 2006, they were the victims of, quite possibly, the wackiest and the craziest playoff scenario of all time. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below.
If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.